Hello, Internet. Hello, Internet. How do you do? We got rid of Chase. So now we Pat, did. Pat and I are in charge. Yeah, yeah. Chase got fired um, by, I don't know, somebody. Probably. Heather. Not me. Probably Heather. Somebody. Maybe. Probably Heather. That checks out. Maybe Oreo. So. <laughs> uh, that would also check out. No, he actually has a legit excuse, I guess. He does. Do you want to fill in the crowd? Um, no, I'll leave that up to you. Huh. <laughs> I, I actually think he, wasn't he out for like a birthday lunch with his yeah, mom basically. and grandmother? So Yeah, his mom and grandma live uh, down in South Georgia where he's from. And they kind of surprised him with a birthday lunch today. So, Yes, but his birthday he's... isn't for a couple more days, actually. But... No, it's uh, it's Saturday. So happy early birthday uh, to Chase, I guess. Yeah. So uh, he made. Goes turn Chase into the new special producer. True. Oh, wow. <laughs> what, what, what a swap. So, I know. Does that mean I have to do my best Chase impression? Uh, Esponsia. <laughs> so just mispronounce things. Yep. Say things read without can, reading. Read without reading. Say things that can get clipped to get me in trouble. Yep. Yep. And talk about people that matter. Yeah, so. that's about it. Okay, cool. Well, welcome, everyone. We'll try to get I'm moving not. along. Chase may join us here shortly. Uh, but if not, you're stuck with Patty, Rick, and I. But we'll do the best we can to hold this down. Yeah, so. sorry, not sorry. Yeah, uh, so. Uh, just, it is what it is today. Hey, yeah. Uh, uh, last weekend, Patty, Rick, and I had a little extra time to hang out. Uh, yeah, a little bit of extracurricular activities. We yeah. got to go. Uh, I think you you made it all the way up to Canton to was it Ride Now that's up there? Yep. And you got to do the Kawasaki demo ride, and I got on the bike with my uh, my wifey, and we headed that way, and got to Mountain because I needed to adjust my suspension, and I walked in the front door, and they said, "Hey, we're doing a we're doing a uh, Cow or a Ducati demo day," and I called Ghost and was like, "Hey, Kawasaki's cool and everything, but Ducati demo day." <laughs> yep. So, so we got to ride a couple of bikes. Yeah, so I went from, I rode a Kawasaki, got a call from Pat, rode to Mountain Motorsports, rode a Ducati, went back to Ride Now, rode another Kawasaki, and then I was like, I'm going home. So, yeah, Ghost, I'm, the chat is saying your mic is a little low. My mic is a little low. Last week, it was a little high, so I'm trying to mm -hmm. find a, is it better if I'm closer like this? Probably. I don't know. I have you turned way up because I'm deaf as a doornail. So. Okay. Um, I just I get you turned way up. So. I'll just uh, talk into the mic and we'll see how that does. So. Well, cool. Well, I guess I'll, I'll do the intro. Uh, welcome to your weekly, semi-weekly, occasionally weekly motorcycle uh, live show slash podcast kind of thing. Uh, I'm Patty Rick. I am Ghost on Two Wheels. Let's go. Uh, Chase on two wheels is not here this week because he's a punk. Um, he said he may <laughs> or may not call in. We'll see. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, we are available on all major podcasting platforms, I believe. Um, and you can see us Thursdays, 4.30 to 6 p.m. Eastern here on the Live on Two Wheels YouTube channel. There you go. I feel like that's it. I feel like that's it. So today's topic uh, a little moto administration. So what's all the BS that goes on other than just Jeez. sitting on the bike and riding it? Um, you know, there's so much, th there's a lot to it. And, you know, a lot of it is a pain in the butt, but, but it is necessary and understandable. So, um, I think we had some comments a while back talking about like, you know, given, especially new riders, what's the lay of the land, like buying your first bike, how to even get a license, you know, stuff that is, very trivial to us experienced riders but yeah when you, when you don't know you just don't know so we thought we would get into that a little bit um yeah uh and so let's just dive right into it and, and first talk about like just getting licensed to ride and uh very early on in the comments i saw nick ingles had asked you know like when did you guys first start riding so um, Pat, maybe, oh, man. maybe you can kind of talk about that. I know you were probably on a bike when you came out the womb, weren't you? Just, just about, just around. about. So, and yeah, I, I uh, go ahead. I was just gonna say, I was kind of the 
opposite of that. So I didn't. Yeah, get into you it. you fairly fairly recently you got you got on bikes, right? Uh, well, it was about, I mean, relative. about eight years ago when I started, but still, that's yeah, yeah. later in life than most people. But yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. So I I uh, basically uh, good to know control. I'll I'll uh, get those updated soon. Control I don't. Um, but I basically got tossed onto a dirt bike about three years old. Um and uh have been kind of addicted to the platform ever since there has been i grew up woods racing as i've talked about many times on the show and um i did i dabbled in motocross and then realized that i sucked too much to do that uh too much because i ended up just hurting myself all the time um but yeah uh i got my first i got my motorcycle license like forever ago um let me rephrase that i did a horrible thing i got my motorcycle permit at 16 mm. and just kept renewing it for years oh my <laughs> years and years and years just because i like never had to, i could go online and renew it and i never had time to set the appointment and then go sit over the dmv in fulton county for four hours on a weekday like i since yeah. i since i was 14 i've been in school and or working a full-time job i just haven't had time like so I did a terrible thing. This is a do as I say, not as I do situation, and I just renewed my permit forever. Um, but yeah, I basically it got to the point where I was just, you know, the permits like you can't ride at night. I was like, that's too bad. And like you can't ride across straight borders. I was like that's too bad. <laughs> like, I'm doing I just it. Did it anyway. Right. Yeah, and this is a do as I say, not as I do situation. Like we talked about on our motorcycle ethics episode that we've all done stupid things and we've grown up but yeah a little older a little wiser so what are the mm -hmm. main differences you touched on them like a, a motorcycle permit because i didn't do that uh yep. i'm sure it may vary from state to state but also isn't there like you can get the permit at 16 and then you have to wait until 17 or 18 for a license um Is that i in think there too? with a car you can get a permit a driver's license permit at 15 on a motorcycle it is at 16 um the restriction i believe is like you can't ride at night you can't ride on major freeways and you can't have a passenger and you can't like cross state lines basically mm -hmm. um you know it the i think you can do that i think it's six months like after the first six months they'll let you okay um kind of just do your thing yeah so but you... you have to go and like to get the permit test you do a written test not a skills test to get a full license you do both mm -hmm. um and i just never had time to get around to doing the the skills test till uh way too recently a couple years back oh really <laughs> <laughs> dude i ran uh, i ran that permit it must have been for six or seven years wow no yeah like somewhere between five and seven years like way too long Wow, that's incredible! Yeah, you. Yeah. So everyone, Dave in chat talking about how he had his for eight. <laughs> Goo. <Yeah. laughs> well, Dude, hard to find time. Yeah, so I kind of went the opposite route. So uh -huh. I just actually started with the MSF course. I did not. Smart move. I, yeah. Wise choice. <laughs> I didn't grow up on bikes or anything. It just wasn't in my circle yeah. where I grew up. Sure. Um, you know, my mom is just like motorcycles are dangerous okay they're not going to spontaneously combust anyway I'm, well you know if you hit something hard enough maybe uh, yeah that's true uh but anyway i was when i was just looking into it i thought i'm going to go take the msf course one almost as kind of a litmus test of sort to see would i even enjoy this you know yeah because the msf most places will provide the bike which yeah. is great yeah so i didn't have to go whole hog and like you know spend five six seven thousand dollars on a bike and whatever and then be like oh i hate this but yeah, yeah. i could go do the course so i did that um and within the msf course there's also a written test that you do mm -hmm. that that they teach you about beforehand and then uh just like the skills test you have to do at the driver's office or whatever you do that same skills test at the end of the msf course but they teach you how to do it and the cool yeah, thing about the, like guarantee the passing. Right. right. And so here's the thing, like there was a few people that they were doing the skills test. Um, and if you like, I think if you fail one of them with the, yeah, they'll let you do it again. Right. 
Well, like with the driver's office, if you just go straight to that, if you fail one of the tests, it's like, whoops, you're you're done. But yeah. it, with the MSF course, they're like, oh, you messed up. Here's what you need to work on. Let's try it again. Yeah, they, they're a little bit better about teaching you through the things that you, you – um, I want to say I don't want to say fail at, but like struggle with something that you they they see sure. you, um, having a tough time getting the concept of or something like that. Yeah, and the I feel like the 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 motorcycle course like the test itself the course is fantastic. The test itself is like, hey, can you do all these really weird, obscure, super tight U turn S turn kind of thing? The box like in a parking lot, and I'm like, you'll never do that in real life. Right. Like there would be very few situations where you have to do these things in real life. Yeah, I think the probably the most relevant one is like coming to a stop while you're in a turn. So you, you have to, to you straight yeah, straight to a stop in a turn, and then I think there's one where like you go, and then they tell you at the last second which way to go. You have to hit the blinker. You've got a head check, hit your blinker, and make the move fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. That is very relevant in my point of view. Just yeah. giving you that. I've got to quickly make a make a educated decision and make sure it's safe and then do the thing. Yeah, but who's doing the box every day? Other than Doodle. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I was like <laughs> Doodle and then the uh the guy, the be the boss of your bike guy. He's a cruiser guy yeah. in South Georgia in I think Pool. Mm -hmm. Um and he like uh is a bit like a big Harley guy who teaches people how to maneuver big bikes slowly in big parking lots. Yeah. But, it's like great skill to have, but like, you know, that guy does it every single day. That's yeah. about it. <laughs> but but I can see, you know, that is like you said, it's a good skill to have. So I, I can mm -hmm. get it though. But yeah, it, it, once you do it in the MSF course and you pass, then they gave me a certificate that I went to the driver services office, as they call it here yeah. in Georgia, and basically yep. said, "Here, I passed this. Got yeah, a new license with the uh, uh, motorcycle endorsement." So no, he's easy, which so, is great. And it like, I recommend the MSF course to everybody, even veteran riders who've been doing it for a long time, just as a skills check. And like, you know, mm -hmm. I've done it twice and you can learn a lot of things from it. Um, you know, but I did it well after I had. My... Yeah. Um, and I do want to say that, uh, Randrew sent me a note on this. The MSF, uh, this year is having some ride days, which is basically like an open house of the MSF course. Where oh, okay. where you just show up and then uh, they have like a beginner course like, um, what would you call it? They just they just kind of like crash course. A little crash but, course, yeah. But hopefully you don't crash. But you like take thirty. Yeah. But they teach you how to ride a motorcycle in like thirty minutes. Um, you know it's it's short because they can want to get people through there. But they also have like an advanced rider course where it's like a skills test. So mm -hmm. if you've been riding a while, you can do the like an advanced course and they can give you some little pointers and everything i actually uh did that with my wife about a year and a half ago oh, right on. The, the one up in alpharetta yeah yeah, they, at the they, Honda Center. yeah so she actually did the uh, beginner course and i did the uh the advanced skills check so um oh, right on. yeah if anybody's interested check that out uh the what's their mm -hmm. website if you have questions about it and you're on our discord uh randrew is one of the admins on the discord and uh fuck off dooley uh <laughs> ranger is one of the uh one of the instructors and can really good at answer questions i love that's coming from dooley who's crashed at almost every single track day you've done if i recall did you crash at your last track day and the one before that punk ass Ooh. bitch <laughs> <laughs> be giving me shit listen yeah. i know how to fall over at red lights i'm real good at that <laughs> Yeah, I'm gonna put the link to that in the uh, in the chat. So it's like msf-usa.org. They'll have yep. some dates and locations where they're doing the ride day. Um, yeah, so, absolutely great. Uh, great group of people over there. Really, really intelligent and um, helpful folks. If I recall, at the Honda Center, there's a couple of guys who are like ex like pro racers that teach the course. So nice. Um, some really really good knowledgeable folks down there. Yeah, one of the other benefits of the MSF course, which we'll get on a little bit more later, is you also get a little break on your insurance cost you if do. you if you have that under your belt. So, yeah, um, just like any defensive driver's course, but you know, for motorcycle stuff, I did also learn recently that if you have, depending on your insurance company, if you have an airbag vest, uh, 
I think it also gives you a bump on your insurance to help you out. Really? And Dooley, you were not racing last time. You were racing yourself for a lap time at Barber, you dummy. <laughs> I don't want to hear it. <laughs> you weren't racing nobody. <laughs> you were shooting for lap time for shits and giggles and ran into an air fence. <laughs> I'm staying out of this one. <laughs> no, Dooley knows I love him. He's one of my one of my one of the homies and um he did unfortunately he got the lap time but if you know anything about barbers you need to start breaking pretty far before the start finish if you're gonna make it into t1 and this man just left it pinned so that he could get his lap time and then was not able to slow down for t1 and unfortunately had an off into the air fence thankfully obviously he's okay uh which was great his suit did its job which is great and the bike wasn't too terribly beat up um but yeah, I do know how to crash off-road. I did a lot of that. I do know how to fall over at red lights. I do know how to do that a lot. But Dooley knows how to crash on a track, so... I've never done that. I've never crashed on a, like, a road course on a motorcycle. So, hmm. I feel like that's a win in my book. <laughs> Frank Torrey. I mean, I lost a lot, but I maybe have won one. Frank Torrey, word to the wise, don't do wheelies in the parking lot before a MSF class. Yeah. Well, just don't don't do them at the msf parking lot do it at the parking lot next door yeah unless you have a cool instructor that says okay they know what they're doing they're here just for the check in a box but yeah otherwise probably refrain from that anyway i believe it is moto photo time it's moto photo time you want to do the screen share uh yeah i can give me just a second yeah i got i got a couple other things going on here so i'm gonna i'll defer to you on that one Okay, we'll do it. All right, so the moto photo. Moto photo. Okay, so the first moto photo is a, ooh, it's a Honda CBR125. Yeah. Um, so I'm assuming that's a European bike. I don't think we got those in the US. That might be Asian, I don't know. Uh, from user HDS420. Hmm. Oh God, my camera is losing its mind. Love yeah, that. Oh, those really thin wheels. <laughs> yeah, those are tiny, but tiny, they, tiny wheels. They don't wheels. cost as much. No, they're they're very inexpensive. And actually, editor Chris um, from the Chase on Two Wheels channel is looking at, uh, I think the CBR 125, the Papio, and the Jixer 125. There's a Jixer 125. Mm-hmm. And honestly, Google it. it. It's a. I'll Google it here in a minute. It's a good looking bike. Uh, our next photo is, oh, oddly enough, uh, uh, guys, right? I'm sure this is planned, from <laughs> yeah. Randrew at the MSF course on, what's what is that, a fleet of TW200s and a uh, Rebel? Could it looks like be, it. Could be, yeah. That's what it looks like. But yeah, um, let's see here. We'll go to our next moto photo. Miss underscore fortune, a little rain ain't stopping me, and on a K1300R... Yeah, I can't imagine that it would. That's a fantastic bike, single-sided swing arm, like sport tour all the way, super comfortable. Um, really, really solid machine for sure. And a great view. And yeah. A great view. Oh, and yeah. then quad. Okay. <laughs> Every time. <laughs> Every time. Um, honestly, I think for me, for this week's Moto Photo, I'm going to give it to Miss Fortune. Okay. What, what does Miss Fortune get? Uh, Miss Fortune gets your, uh, your recognition, a, uh, my recognition, and a prize from Ghost. I don't know what is it. What? Um, okay. Oh, I'm throwing you under the bus. <laughs> <laughs> Got an air horn. Got an air horn. Great, super awesome. duper. Well, that was uh, Moto Photo. That is a great little thread over in our Discord channel where you can post photos of your motos. Photos of your motos. Of your motos. <laughs> On the moto photo. I'm doing this so I don't normally do this, so y'all are just getting what we get. But I will look up a GSXR125. Yeah. This little guy is just adorable. And like if I didn't know better, looks like a full size jixer. Mm-hmm. Like has a good single like headlight up front. Um, like has you know, gold brakes, looks real pretty. It's standard style fork on the front. And a lot of OEMs have like a one two five that they use for a lot of Asian markets. There's the the mm-hmm. CBR. There's the isn't there an R one two five from Yamaha 
or something? Uh, I believe so. Yeah, there's there's yeah. quite a few of the 125 classes that exist outside of the U.S. Um, and a lot of really cool accessories. I mean, yeah, I believe they have a race series in parts of the Asian market as well. Um, that is like specific to 125s. So, yeah, super cool bike. Um, you know, they boogie from what I understand for what they are. And it's like proper clip-ons. It's not like a weird clip-ons that are super high like we get on like the CBR 500 here in the U.S. It's like a actual proper clip-on. Hmm. Hello, that one's doing a wheelie. There you go. It does wheelies. So that's all I need to know. Moving on. Mm, that may not be real. I don't know. Um, <laughs> I, don't know. I just work here. All right. Um, Thanks for yeah. sharing that, Pat. Yeah. So, all right. Back on topic. Moto administration. Um, I, I had a community post prior to this show, and um, our our friend Hobbit of Chaos, K O S. Oh Lord, the old Hobbit. He's back at it again. Um, you know, he had a, a good comment actually that was going to be about uh, a few things we talk about. He says, uh, dealer fees and the ways to negotiate out of them or get them lower, what the importance of them are, um, how to see like which ones are scams on private sellers and how to actually negotiate. And in parentheses, yes, this is also me asking so I don't end up with a crappy situation with my truck again. <laughs> Um, God, it. Um, yeah, but that's... a few good things about, you know, buying a bike, you know, is not just, you know, go in, drop money and walk out. You know, it's not like you're buying a pair of pants. It's a, yeah, li yeah. a little it's, bit more than that. It's um, the same as buying any other vehicle, um, especially if you're in a position that you are financing it. Um, I personally try not to finance bikes, but that's just because I ride like a dumb idiot and I'm probably going to break it. <laughs> and I, if I'm going to break it, I want it to be nine, not the banks, but totally understandable. You know, people finance bikes as a way to get around. They're very inexpensive. They're great on gas. It's a great way to save money. If you know, you're like Hobbit, you've got a truck, gas guzzling truck, mm -hmm. and you'd rather have a bike that's both fun, good on insurance. It's good on, you know, fuel. I will say there's probably a line in motorcycling because you said it saves money. But if you get to a certain point where you just go so much oh. into motorcycling, you're not saving money. <laughs> no, you can definitely tip way too far in the wrong direction. No, no, um, but generally speaking, it they cost less up front. They cost mm -hmm. less to run. So, mm -hmm. but there exactly. is that startup cost also with gear and and things like that, which yeah, and that's we'll that's something that but... we'll talk about a little later on for sure. But as it pertains to Hobbit's particular question about fees and things like that, um, you know, with a new bike, there are going to be fees. It just is what it is. Um, there's, you're going to have to pay tax on it no matter what, whether you buy it private party or through a dealer. So it really doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Um, if you trade a bike at a dealer, um, you can get a benefit against the value that you owe on the bike you're buying. Um, but if you're buying one outright, um, you know, the dealer fees are hard to get around. I know a lot of dealers don't like to, to disclose exactly what those fees are or what they go to. Um, you know they will claim freight and prep. We're in a we're in a a, a tight territory here because there's a lot of things that like some bikes show up and you've got to put the wheels on and the handlebars and the foot pegs and like they are I just got an ad. Um, you know there are there are quite a few times that bikes show up. And, uh, this comes from my experience working in a dealership that mm -hmm. they are most of the way disassembled. Like the bodywork yeah. and the engine and all that is put together, but you've got to put wheels on and handlebars and bleed the brakes and like it's a whole thing yeah so there's a legit cost and some overhead yeah. for the dealership to get that ready correct and, and, there are also bikes that you spin the mirrors on and it's done yeah. you spin the mirrors on and plug the battery up and it's done yeah and that's the vast majority of the larger bikes so you know your I'll, I'll say middleweight and above so you know mm -hmm. five six hundred cc's and up nine times out of ten depending on the manufacturer it's like spin the mirrors on connect the battery, put oil and gas in it, or not even, most of them have oil, put gas in it, run it. So it, it it's a frustrating thing for me. I think the dealer prep fees need to come back down. Um, thank you, camera, for unfocusing. Yeah, especially um, with the uh, with pandemic stuff, there was like the freight surcharge, which is added on top of the regular yeah. destination fees. I mean, yes, it does cost 
a couple hundred dollars to ship a 600 pound machine across the country. Yeah. It yeah. costs money. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I guess maybe to Hobbit's point about like uh, negotiate out of them, you're not going to negotiate out of them, but the, ba- the thing to look at is just the out the door price. That's what you're going to hear a lot of times. I think. Yeah. Sometimes you can negotiate down the out the door price where I guess they would work the numbers of the cost of the bike but still have their required fees on there. And, yeah, and there, go ahead. You know, there, there's some, some dealerships that tell you the full cost out the door up front. Triumph for Oswell, um, as a good example, not to plug them, although we do love them. They're good friends of the channel. Um, if you go into their dealership and you, they have the spec sheet for every bike that's on their floor. If you grab that spec sheet and flip it over, it has all of the pricing, MSRP, tax tag title, mm-hmm. like literally everything, your out the door price already there. So like they are, they're, they're super transparent, which I love. Yeah. Um, really proud of the way they do business. Um, there are other dealerships that they don't hide that from you per se, but like they don't make it as easy to get that information. You have to, right. you know, Hey, I want to see the numbers and it's that whole negotiating thing, but then they'll have like a 15 to $1,800 prep fee. And I'm like, that's I like, I get it. The dealership has to make money, but that's ridiculous. Right. Like yeah. there is, there is no reason that that needs to be a thing. And um, something that that Nick makes a good point on in chat just now um, is MSF coaches will say to try to negotiate some free gear. If you're at a dealership and you know you're looking at gear that is your first bike, or you just want maybe you want some parts and accessories for the bike you're looking at, that is a good point mm-hmm. um, to try to negotiate stuff like that. Um, that being said. It is, as someone who's worked in parts and in service and a very short stint in sales at Power Sports and regular automotive dealerships, you know, getting the different departments to work together can kind of be a pain in the butt. Because from a, like, Mountain Motorsports, for example, you walk in and you're looking at a bike and you're talking to your sales guy or whatever, and then they'll take you over to parts to pick out a bunch of parts that they also want you to buy, which, understandable, they want you to buy gear and be safe and get all the maintenance things you're going to need, all that stuff. Understandable. I get it. But then you'll go talking to your sales guys. Hey, I want, you know, if you're not going to negotiate on the price, I want to get these parts for free, or I want this big discount on parts. You, you can kind of use that because then essentially what happens is sales buys the parts from the parts department. Like they're in one building, but it operates as three separate businesses. Well, you got budgets and line items and it's all a that. whole thing. Yeah. So if they give you some grief about that, um, that you know that's because most dealerships operate. It's one business, but it's really three separate departments that don't really, you know, the bottom line on the bottom of your sales sheet doesn't necessarily reflect mm-hmm. where the money is going, if that makes sense. Um, that being said, you know, just talk to your salesperson, find somebody that you trust. Um, there's some really good folks over at Mountain. There's some great folks at Triumph. There's some great folks at Killer Creek, the three dealerships we typically deal with. Um, wow, over in Marietta has some really great folks over there. Um, you know, and I'm yeah. not saying that one person at these dealerships is going to do you better than another, but find somebody that you, um, you know, you trust and you connect with, and make sure you get the best deal for you. And like I said, like talk talk to people about free gear. Talk to them about maybe like the service plans and things like that. You may not be able to negotiate fees away, but you might be able to negotiate um, heavy discounts on stuff. That's going to be more of an incentive for them to help you out. Yeah. There can be different places where they can eat a little bit more cost and Mm -hmm. get you some benefit Mm -hmm. out the door. Um, Yeah. So one thing I think Nick Ingalls mentioned this, uh, we can go ahead and talk about that is if you're looking at a bike, go ahead and figure out what the insurance is going to be on that bike. Yes. A lot of people, as first-time riders especially, are are kind of blindsided by the cost of insurance, which is even higher if you're financing a bike because you have to have yeah. full coverage. So if you're looking at a bike before you actually go sign on the dotted line, go get a quote for that bike from your favorite insurance company yeah. uh, and, and just kind of see what the ballpark is because it can be up there. And if you're... Yeah, I mean, and- Especially it, depending on the class of bike. So a, a lot of things factor into that. Uh, your age, mm-hmm. your riding experience, which if you're new is zero, which means you 
pay more. But if you have that MSF, you're like course, me and tell them you've been racing dirt bikes forever, and they'll be like, "Oh, so you're a racer? That's even worse." <laughs> yeah, because you're a dummy. Uh, yeah. No, but if you have that MSF course, that can help out. Um, mm-hmm. I've even seen you know where just if you have ABS on the on the bike, that can help. That can factor ABS in. ABS the thing again. Your an airbag system of some variety will help out. You know, things like that are legitimate concerns for insurance companies and will help you. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so yeah, I mean, if you're a first-time buyer um, at a dealership and you don't have a big budget where you may have to finance, you're still going to have to pay those fees. They may be worked in somewhere else and insurance. Mm-hmm. So the sticker price yeah. is not the sticker price. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Don't remember, it's MSRP plus tax, tag, title. Um, your taxes, whatever your, you know, depending on what county you live in and what state, you're going to pay a tax rate. Mm-hmm. Uh, your tag fee is generally anywhere between 55 and like a hundred bucks, depending on your state and your county. Um, and then your title fee is generally about the same. Sometimes yeah. they do tag and title as a single fee. Um, and then your, your freight and prep fee, which is, um, we could do a whole episode on that. Um, but then again, your like insurance on, a DRZ 400 SM supermoto is vastly different than a DRZ 400 S, which is the true dual sport. Like I think I, when I was, I was, hmm. I bought a DRZ 400 S years ago. Um, and I was going to get an SM and the insurance was three times as much. Ooh. Cause they were like, yeah, that's a super commonly crashed bike. And I'm like, yeah, well I'm getting the dual sport model cause it's slow. And they're like, Oh, you like that it's slow. And I was like, yes slow ah. you know not not that i didn't throw hot cams and a fat 48 millimeter bakuti carburetor in it or anything like, that'd be crazy no i know nothing <laughs> i know you this is not the bike you're looking for yeah but it is crazy like, like how, how much just difference it can cost from models that are pretty close yeah. but uh but yeah the, the insurance companies have all the numbers they run all that yeah um, and there's like sport bikes especially are you are going to get railed on your insurance yeah I well and, and to be clear like the super sport like the oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, well no i mean like even the the new zx4 rr they classify as a sport bike oh oh yeah yeah absolutely yeah like, that it's a 400 cc's well like like i'm thinking of the example like if i went and i got a cbr 500 versus a cbr 600 those are going to be way different yeah, yeah, but because the thing is, a CBR 500 and a CBR 650 are like sport bikes. The CBR 600 RR is a super sport, mm-hmm. but they're going to classify all three of those as a sport bike. Oh, well, I actually, with uh, Progressive, had a different experience when I was... Oh, did they? Oh, uh, well, State Farm screwed yeah. me then. Because I, I was looking at that one. Anyway, go get your quotes. So, yeah, yeah. Um, kind of shifting mean, a little bit, uh, what about used bikes from the dealer? Used bikes are... Um, you know, whether it's from a dealership or from a private party, I always recommend getting them inspected. Either like, like for example, Mountain Motorsports, I only say this because I used to work there, is a used bike would come in, it would go to the service department, like during your trade inspection, they would do an inspection on the bike to see, you know, if they have records of maintenance, if you have records of maintenance, what things are scratched or beat up or how many miles are on the bike and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. They'll look at your brake pads, the quality of your tires, your coolant, your brake fluid. Blah, 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 blah. They look through all of this different stuff to see if this bike is well-maintained or not. And then if it's not, or if it, if it even if it is well-maintained, but maybe it needs, it needs an oil change in 200 miles or whatever. They will basically, if they end up buying that bike or taking it in on trade, before it goes out to the floor, they service these bikes. Yeah. So they do, they make sure the brakes are working properly. They make sure the tires are good. They make sure XYZ is all good. It's so like generally buying from a dealership, and most dealerships operate like that. It's a fairly safe bet. I would obviously visually inspect it if you know anything about motorcycles or Google things to look out for. Like, because bikes, it's easy. You could very easily look at the brake pads on a bike and see how yeah. much life is left. You can look at a rotor and see if it's grooved. Um, you know, checking the oil on a bike at a dealership, they might give you some grief for if you're just out there, you know, taking oil caps off. But um, like if they've got a sight glass, stand the bike up, look at the sight glass. Mm-hmm. You know, there are just make sure that you're 
getting a well-maintained machine and that's even more so with private party because obviously private party yeah. oh well the previous owners said they did the valves it's like cool you have zero record of that if right. you're looking at a high mileage bike um but if you get the chance if you're looking at a at a pre-owned bike used bike from a private party i would very much recommend that you have it inspected by a reputable shop yeah a little bit more because I've I've purchased a couple used bikes from the dealer. There is typically a you know two three hundred dollar uh, fee that they put on that a service fee uh, just mm-hmm. for yep. for covering all the things that Pat said of you know checking the tires or making sure that when they're selling the bike they're putting out a bike to you that is not going to kill you. So yeah, because there is a huge amount of liability on the dealership to mm-hmm. provide safe bikes to ride. People be like, oh, the, well, they want to make the most money. It's like, yeah, but if you if they sell you a, a bike that's falling apart, you crash it, sue the bejesus out of them, they're going to lose a ton of money, you know, because yeah. they sold you a bike that's legitimately dangerous. So they, it is in their best interest to int- interest to <laughs> sell you a safe – English is hard. It is in their best interest to sell you a safe motorcycle. Right. So, I mean, you can expect that fee to be on there, and that's certainly mm-hmm. justifiable as well. Um, so yeah. don't be surprised if they have to add that on yeah. at the end. That's but, definitely going to cover you know, whatever maintenance they had to do. But it's not going to be like as much as the freight and prep and things like that. Oh, at least yeah. it shouldn't Getting, be. No, it's, if, it's definitely not. It shouldn't be. If you, if you get a – like used bikes are a great way to avoid those really fat fees up front. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you can find a bike that's maybe a year or two old or whatever, still has a little bit of warranty or a lot of dealerships will, you can buy a warranty from them. Um, that's a great way to go. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I did. Like, (laughs) so, uh, yeah. And you kind of touched on things, buying from a private seller. Um, you don't get that assurance that you get from the dealer. Mm -hmm. Um, unless, you know, like you said, I guess they can work something out to go get it inspected. Um, yep. Have you actually dealt with that where you've bought from a private yep. party and had it inspected and like, yeah, I mean, I've who, dealt with it on bikes and cars. Yeah. Yeah. So like who covers the cost of that inspection? Do you just kind of try to work um, it out with the seller? Generally it is the buyer. Um, okay. Makes sense. So similar like with, uh, for people who are buying, I'm in, also in the middle of buying a house right now. Home is if I want to send a home, an inspector to go look at this house I'm buying to ensure it's not a total piece of shit. I'm paying for that inspection. Because if that inspection comes back and says, like, this thing's fucked, I'm not going to buy it. But I don't want to force the seller to pay, um, you know, pay for it, for that inspection. That's It is historically and generally the buyer pays for the inspection because it's the buyer. It's in the buyer's best interest for XYZ to happen. Now, most shops will charge you about an hour of labor, whatever that is, anywhere between 100 and 160 bucks, depending on what shop you go to. Right. Yeah, that so makes if you're going to spend six grand on a bike, spend the hundred to make sure it's not a piece of shit. Yeah. So let's say you're buying from a private seller um, and you're not taking it to a dealer to get inspected for whatever reason. What are the key signs to look for on the bike to say, is this a well-kept or well-maintained or just a good bike? What do you look for? Sure. I mean, obviously mileage is very, very dependent on what you're going to look for. If it's fairly low miles, there's not going to be a ton to look at. Um, but like I said earlier, it's easy to see brake pads on 99% of motorcycles. You can just kind of look into the top of the caliper and see them. Um, you can look, so brake pads, brake rotors, brake fluid level and color. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of reservoirs on handlebars are solid or have a little, you know, they're, they're clear. Um, you know, hold your phone flashlight or a regular flashlight up to it. See what that fluid looks like. Does it have debris in it or anything? Um, check the oil level, coolant level, if it's easy to see, if it's not, then ask if you can, you know, have the owner point it out to you or something like that, you know, cause obviously whoever you're buying it from knows more about it than you do more than likely. They should. Um, <laughs> yeah. Right. You would think. Yeah. And then just obviously like tires, the DOT date on the tire. So how old are they? Is, has the bike been sitting for a long time? Does it have gas in it? A really common thing on older bikes and still newer bikes is, uh, you'll get rust on the inside of the fuel tank. Mm-hmm. which is not exactly helpful. No. Um, and that is something you want to check. I can't tell you the amount of times that I've looked over a bike and been like, man, this thing's really good. And I pop the fuel tank open, get a flashlight in there, and it's super rusty. I'm like, cool, I want nothing to do with this. Mm. Um, 
And then, yeah, Charles makes a good point in chat. Request the bike not be started when you get there. I much prefer to hear a cold start Yes. on a bike than a warm start. Because obviously a warm start, everything's warmed up and everything. You've got oil in all the right passages. You could, you know, buy a bike that you the guy had ridden around the block to make sure it was warmed up for you. You take it around the block or whatever if the guy is lets you do a test ride. And then you're like, great, motor sounds great, no problem. You get home, the next morning you go out, and it's knocking. Like, you know, it's mm-hmm. got a major oiling issue, but you didn't hear it because the guy had already warmed it up for you. So it's, you know, yeah, there's a lot of bikes. He's helping you out. <laughs> he's helping you out. You'll start the bike, and it will knock, 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 Even if it's just for a second while the oil is circulating, yeah. that tells you there's a problem. Yeah. So, I mean, there's a there's a lot to look out for, but... Yeah, and some of the yeah. obvious thing to look out is just like on the side of the engine case, the the bar ends. Yeah. Look for scrapes. Yeah, look for scrape scratches. I, I'm i not super worried about a bike that's like fallen over in a garage or a parking lot or yeah, whatever. A, yeah, a little nick here and there can be a little driveway tip over or bumping. Not a big deal. Yeah. But if you're seeing like, you know, yeah, if, big, if it's long scrapes. scrapes like be careful if uh, especially inspect the swing arm if you get the you know depending on what style of bike you're looking at mm-hmm. um the swing arm is considered an essential part of the frame on almost all motorcycles so an insurance company will total a bike for a cracked scratched or dented swing arm scratched if you have a deep enough scratch in okay. a swing arm deep a enough. lot of insurance companies will total it because it is considered frame damage interesting yeah, fun fact. I've lost quite a few bikes to frame damage that had I covered it with a Sharpie, no one would have ever known. Yeah. Hmm. And it's, you know, it's just stuff like that. Very interesting. Um, uh, yeah, If I would also say if you can get maintenance records from the mm. seller, um, obviously that can tell you that the bike was maintained, but the fact that a seller has all that information should also a, give you a lot of confidence. Flag. Yeah, get a lot yeah, of confidence I, in that. So I have a binder for every vehicle that I own with all my maintenance records, unless the dealership keeps them digitally or they email them to me, in which I have them on a hard drive. Mm-hmm. So like all, every, you know, every time I take the Super T anywhere to get any maintenance done, like I don't, you know, when I was working at Mountain Motorsports, I was working all the time. I didn't have time to do maintenance on the Super T. It's just a pain in the ass. So I just let them deal with it. Mm-hmm. Um, cause one, you get a good, you know, you're working in a motorcycle shop, you get, you get helped out on the price. It is what it is. So like they have records of all of that stuff, which is great. But I also have records cause I have, I keep all the receipts. I go into mountain or whatever local place and I buy all the oil and I buy my filters and I keep that receipt. I snap a picture of it. I email it to myself and then it goes on the hard drive. Nice. So like I, I keep pretty meticulous records of stuff. Um, we have a maintenance plan, like on my wife's Camry that we got with, we have lifetime oil changes from the dealership we bought it from. So like, that's where we take it to get all of its oil changes and any other maintenance that needs to get done. It gets done there. Yeah. Cause it's one, we get, we get a good price on it. And two, um, it's just an easy way to keep records, but that car's only got 20,000 miles on it. So yeah. It's only had oil changes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you, you can't think like, filters. like yeah, changing the oil is, is an easy task that, you know, m- most yeah. people can easily do, but mm-hmm. if you can do it like through the dealer or servers and have record of that, that certainly is bonus points when you sell the vehicle later on. Yeah. Just for to sure. have that. For sure. uh, so, yeah. And, and just remember if you buy from private, you still have to register the bike yourself and get a yeah, tag. You still got to register it. You still need to pay taxes on it. Um, you know, people, it's a common misconception that you have 30 days after you buy a vehicle, at least in the state of Georgia, to register it. No, you do not. You get like 45 days if you get a temporary tag from a dealership. If you buy a private party, you have seven days. Mm -hmm. Now, if you fill out your bill of sale and your title with a date that's maybe different, different, (laughs) maybe, (laughs) Uh, I'm not saying. I'll tell you what, I can neither confirm nor deny any allegations against myself or any parties I may or may not be involved with. So, a benefit of buying a bike from the dealer, new or used, is they will take care of that registration and whatever for you. Mm-hmm. You'll get the tag in the mail. Um, benefit of a private sale is you're probably going to get the price a lot lower 
but mm-hmm. you have to be more careful and you have to do some of that registration yourself. Yeah, you're so. gonna have you're gonna have a little more admin work, oddly enough, to do um, yourself versus having the dealership take care of it. There you go, Dave. Just registered the R6M today for ninety-seven bucks. Dave, did you get nice. that tuning situation figured out? Let me know. Oh, um, if not, I can reach out again. Is that where you had the engine light on? For... Yeah, it's got to check engine light. But we, uh, I tried to get him the software for the, to like run the auto tuner. Mm-hmm. Um, the Rapid Bike Evo software, and I sent him a link to it, and I think it worked. I never heard back. I assuming, I'm assuming it worked, but you should be able to download the software from their website pretty easily. Nice. Um, nice. But yeah, do you want to talk about the types of insurance? Well, let's take a little break. Let's uh, let's hit the quick shifter, Ooh. and then and then we'll uh, we'll come back. We'll do that, and then we'll see where we want to go from there. So, quick shifter brought to us by Welcome Carter Bluetooth quick. Communication. Which they uh, may or may not be having a 25% off sale starting tomorrow. Ooh. So if there you, you go. if you know somebody with a discount code, use it. Stack <laughs> it. I was just saying, I think the discount code is stacked. Okay. Okay. Uh, chat, how was the audio levels on that? Last week it was a little hot, and now I'm a little low, so I just want to make sure that... Uh, I'm just trying to, because it's it's it streams out different than I hear it, and I don't have right, a yeah, super complex sound. You're adjusting soundboard. your, you're adjusting your output volume, not necessarily the output to to stream and chat and stuff. Yeah, well, uh, okay. it's at the shop now. Was overheating on the dyno. I know you said you had an overheating issue, but when you drove it like regularly, it was fine. So keep me updated on that. I'm happy to help any way I can. Um, you want me to do the first one? Uh, yeah, go ahead. So all right, hit it. Uh, BMW is looking at using gimbal-based headlight that moves and stays level as the bike leans rather than different LEDs that light up based on leaning angle, such as corner lights. That's cool. Um, I feel like that is just adding more complexity and complication to BMWs, which are already very complex and complicated. Yeah, it's probably one of those things like, we're going to do this because we can, but at the same time, you know, in five, ten years, that may be like just the standard thing. Yeah, that might be normal. I don't know. You know, it's always some OEM that has to come up with it at some point. Yeah, someone's got to do it first, right? Yeah, absolutely. So that's pretty neat, though. Uh, BMW has had some pretty clever patents. So True. Uh, All right, next up. So Yamaha is showcasing their final edition snowmobiles because Uh, they are saying goodbye to the snow industry. So, I feel like it's been a long time coming. Yamaha has not been a major player in snowmobiles for quite a while. Um, I know that Cowie still makes a good bit, and Polaris just dom- I mean, Ski Do, you know, they are the name in snowmobiles. So mm-hmm. um, I know BRP has been doing really well there. But yeah, I actually didn't know Yamaha still made snowmobiles. Yeah, I wasn't aware of it either. So I was like, well, they were in Georgia. So, you know. right. And. You know, I know it's not two wheels related, but I thought it's interesting that. I mean, it's close enough. It's still a vertical thing that leans. <laughs> uh, Royal Enfield has a couple of demo days in Georgia in the next couple weekends. First is in Marietta, and then the next one at TWO. I did see that. I think that's their second one at TWO this year. I think they did one in like January, and nobody went out because it was raining and cold. Well, I mean, that's what happens when you do that in January. Yeah. So. is but, but yeah. no, I really, I love the Super Meteor 650 launch I went to. Um, I'm a big fan of the the Scramblers, the Scram 411, and the, uh, the uh, what do you call it, the little Hemi, the little Himalayan. I do want to mm-hmm. see the new Himalayan. It, it looks, it's crazy. They went from air-cooled to water-cooled. They added 10 more cc's and I think almost doubled the horsepower. Wow. Look at them coming into the new age. Oh, <laughs> no. All right, everyone. That's the quick shifter, so all right um yeah not nothing too groundbreaking in the news this week no but. no this week's kind of kind of low-key which is good the uh the ibex 450 uh press launch was last week um mm-hmm. our boy joe jackson got to go to that i have scrubbed a lot of the footage and i'm extremely jealous so yeah when's that video um, looking to drop? eventually ah <laughs> <laughs> is there just a lot to kind of sift through or is it just part of your um, schedule uh, it's on the schedule. I just I don't know exactly where it is off the top of my head. Yeah. 
All right. I mean, um, that's cool. I yeah. mean, the Philippines, I, I you know, I, if you don't follow oh. Jackson Photo on Instagram. You uh, should. Photo yeah. with an F. But, you know, I mean, he was posting, you know, every couple hours that he was out there from the Philippines. That dude is on it. His, and, uh, his social media game is on point. Yeah, he, it's really good. It covered it really well. And it looked like it was a pretty cool event. So mm -hmm. uh, what, what do yeah. I need to do to uh, cover the next one? Let's see what I Anyway, yeah. listen, if I figure it out, I'll let you know. I got to figure out how to go to the next one as well. Because Dooley's done two back to back in Spain now. Mm -hmm. uh, I just did one in Vegas, and then there may or may not be a Triumph one coming up that I am very interested in. There is a Honda one I'm doing in Southern California soon. Ooh. Excited about that. A, a new uh, Honda vehicle or an updated? Can you. Uh, it is one that is currently on the market. Mm hmm. Um, and it is not a traditional press ride, but it is like a super cool event, but I cannot say what it is hmm. at this current time. I can neither confirm nor deny any allegations against myself or any parties I may or may not be involved with. So you can't even give me like the hint that Chase would do where it basically tells us what it is without. <laughs> I can neither confirm nor deny any allegations against myself or any parties I may or may not be involved with. Uh, yeah. I love it when he was just like, let me give you this hint. It's this bike. Uh oh, <laughs> <laughs> this bike. We're going here and we're doing this. Chase, that's not a hint. That's just telling people, bud. Yeah. Hey, I, well, I, I get it. So excited yeah. about it. So no, it is uh, uh, It's very, very cool. I'm, I am very, very excited. Uh, I'm pr hopefully not going to die, but if I do, it will be a glorious death. Well, nice knowing you, if not. Mm -hmm. So. Speaking of, how's your insurance? insurance. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you go dying on me. Uh, I'll try not to. I got good life insurance. We'll be fine. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, we talked a little bit about the insurance on the bike uh, and, and kind of some factors into that. Um, you know, there's a big difference between, like, full coverage insurance and then just, like, a liability-only insurance. Same with cars, so you probably know this. Um, and then it, just depending upon how much coverage you have. Um, but for motorcycles, there's, I guess on average, it's more than a car just because of the potential maybe. Yeah. So, so how a lot of insurance is done, um, the liability that a motorcycle rider has to carry is generally motorcycles can go much faster than cars. Mm -hmm. historically motorcycles that get crashed are going much faster than the things they hit so even if it's a small motorcycle at a 130 miles an hour slamming into a car that is stopped it's going to do a massive amount of damage yeah what is it is it force is mass times velocity uh so, yeah so even if the mass is lower but if the your velocity, velocity is, is much higher. higher it's still a big boom <laughs> yeah it's still a big thing so you know um i always recommend full coverage if you can afford it um yeah you know on a, as a motorcyclist you are more likely to be injured than a car you know whether even if it's the car in front of you hits a rock and it rails you in the chest like i've i've had i have a like a ball of scar tissue in my shoulder from a rock like just absolutely oof uh, I was on the freeway, the car in front of me shot it up, and I don't know what happened that it, the rock was going so fast, but it punched through my jacket and into my shoulder. Ouch. Yeah, and like, you know, that's a whole... Hold on, sorry, Chase is texting me. What does he want? Uh, He set up a meeting with uh somebody tomorrow. Oh. <laughs> but who doesn't, doesn't like to answer my phone calls, but we'll talk to Chase immediately. It's funny. Um. <laughs> But, you know, a little bit of shade. Uh, you know, full coverage is definitely what I recommend. Even if you're like, it's, you know, the only reason that you shouldn't have full coverage is if you're doing what I call self-insuring, um, which is a term I picked up from my dad years ago. And it's not like, if it's, you spent $500 on the bike, you legitimately don't care about it, mm -hmm. and you have good medical insurance. Yeah. So you're not worried about the insurance the bike has because if you sneeze on it, you're going to total it. Right. But you need to have insurance for you, let alone the bike. So I'm a big fan of that. 
Um, again, type of bike is a huge factor. We'll go over the factors of the insurance. Like the type of bike is massive. We talked about it earlier, a sport bike versus an adventure bike. The insurance on my, um, what was it? I had a Jixxer 750 for like a week and I hated it because my hurt my back. Mm-hmm. Great bike, hurt my back. The insurance on that is five times what it was on my Super T, which is a 1200. Right. It has the same amount of horsepower and more torque and is a much larger motorcycle, which means if I hit something, it's going to mass, you know, mass my velocity. It's going to do a lot more damage. I think the insurance on that was something like $600 a year full coverage, which is still inexpensive. Uh, my The insurance on my Super T is $74 mm-hmm. for the year full yeah. coverage. Full coverage. Like full cut, like full cut, like the like wow. super high limits or like no deductible, very high coverage limits. It's an old man's bike. Mm-hmm. It's a super T. It's like old people buy them. They don't go very, you know, people that buy those don't crash them often because they don't go very fast. If they crash them, they fix them themselves. Who gives a shit? Right. Um, the age of the bike does make a huge difference. If it's got, you know, if it's a very, very old bike, it's more likely to have mechanical problems. Your insurance does take into account mechanical problems. A lot of people don't know this. Uh, you know, most insurance policies, you'll have to look into yours, obviously. Everyone is different, but have some sort of mechanical coverage. Mm-hmm. So, like, if you buy a brand new car and you have, like, super high insurance, like, super, you know, maxed out full coverage insurance, and you, for some reason, the engine blows up, and it was not your fault, and for some reason, the warranty doesn't cover it, your insurance will probably cover it. I can't tell you the amount of vehicles you see at Copart that are mechanically totaled. Wow. Because, like, it would cost so much money to put a new engine in it or whatever the issue is Mm -hmm. that it's cheaper to total it. Yeah. Another factor with the age of the bike is probably just availability of parts. Like how easy is it going to be to fix it? Even if it's not overly complicated bike, if it's, you can't get a part for it or if it's rare. So a little bit of a, even, even just an older bike, it doesn't even have to be rare. So um, things about the automotive industry is when say Honda was to discontinue the new Civic tomorrow for some crazy reason, they are legally required to continue to produce parts for civics for the next 10 years. Mm-hmm. If they discontinue the CBR 1000 tomorrow, they will stop making parts tomorrow. Ah, Motorcycles do not have that same ordeal. That, Cause they probably fall more under a, this motorcycles are a luxury type of Correct. Mm-hmm. It's a product. luxury or a recreational vehicle. Recreational. Yeah. Yep. Um, so, you know, if you get a, that's why a lot of motorcycle shops, if it's older than 10 years, they won't touch it. Mm-hmm. Cause if they break something on it, the odds of them getting a part virtually non-existent. Mm-hmm. And people will say like, you know, the 06 Jixer has a bunch of the same parts that the new one does. Sure, it does. But there's also a ton of parts on an 06 Jixer that are nowhere near, like they got discontinued in 06 because maybe they went to a different setup in 07 or whatever. You know, so um, even like a 2012 bike at this point, which is wild to say, is more than 10 years old. And I, I'd be willing to bet most of the parts on a bike that the generation ended in 2012 no longer exist. Mm-hmm. You just, you can't get them or like an aftermarket company might produce them. Yeah. But the carburetor, you can go to Makuni or you can go to Holly or whoever and get those parts, but you're not gonna be able to get them from the, the OEM that built the bike. Right. Right. Um, so your age yeah. of the bike makes a huge difference. Cause if you dump it and you scratch a side fairing, like you're, you can't replace it. Your bike's instantly totaled. That's crazy. You can't replace the part. Insurance company has to write you a check for it. And they don't want to. And they absolutely <laughs> don't want to. So they want Or they to want to make sure they've made enough money off of your premium payments that they can do that if you if it happens. One hundred percent. And the next like... thing I see on the list is location. So that's that's a huge thing even just here in Atlanta. <laughs> so yeah. like metro areas Fulton, in general, but yeah. Yeah, but like, you know, even with Fulton County, which is the city of Atlanta is Fulton County, but the very, very north bit of Fulton County, which is the north side of Alpharetta Milton. Is on the edge of Forsyth County. The amount of traffic on that side of Fulton County versus down in the city, hugely different. But you're still in Fulton County, so your insurance is going to be reflected that way. Mm-hmm. Forsyth County, which is where I live, one county north of that, my insurance was like it dumped down a bunch. I'm about to move another county north, and my insurance is going to go down even more. Mm-hmm. So your insurance company will look at one, where you live, and then where you work to see like what your daily commute is. 
Yeah, because there's like a mileage threshold too. Like, how many miles are you are you doing a day? I mean, that, that's another thing that kind of factors in yep. off of this location. Is I mean, if you're driving ten miles a day, man. If you're driving a hundred miles a day, okay, more opportunity for something to go sideways. Yeah, and it's and it's not that, you know, a lot of people. There's a statistic that, you know, most motorcycle accidents happen ten minutes or ten, within ten miles of your home. But it's something like the and like most car accidents, mm -hmm. it's like something outside of unless you're commuting further than that, on a national level, it's like ninety five percent of your trips are within 10 miles of your home. So of course, like that it's correlation not causation. Yeah. Right? I, I mean, so, if there's any other factor to that, it's that the closer you get to home, the more familiar you are with the roads. Yeah. You can let you your guard down a little bit. Pilot. Yeah. So that mm -hmm. that could be a thing too. Um another big factor Congrats in the insurance the cost. Small bore. Say what? Sorry. Small bore. I'm reading chat. I got ADHD, man. You should know. Oh, that's true. Sorry for being late today. New position at work had me doing a presentation. Well, congratulations on the new work position. Good for you. <laughs> we we, we good. hope. We hope it's a congratulations or I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know. It could be a worse position. Uh, that's what she... Anyway, the next thing on insurance, uh, age of the rider. So... Um, yeah. <laughs> you, Huge you, thing. You can go look at the conversation we had, uh, was it last or a couple weeks ago about just the motorcycle ethics. And mm -hmm. when you're young, you're dumb. And yeah, when you're old, you're still dumb, but you, you're slightly less. Le you're less dumb. That's because yeah. you've probably forgotten how to be dumb. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, but even with, uh, with, with car insurance, it's a factor too. Uh, just because mm -hmm. there is, there, or there is that maturity level that, uh, does factor in to yeah. how safe you are on the road. Yeah, and you can be like the most old soul safest rider, you know, in the world, but if you're 19 years old, you're grouped with every other 18 to 25 year old or 16 to 25 year old idiot on the road. Mm -hmm. And then I think that, yeah, the jump is like eight, 16 to 25. 18, 18 to 25, mm -hmm. 25 to 30. And then it's like 30 to 45, and then it's like 45 plus, basically. Until you get way up there, and then I, I think at like 70, your rates start going up again. Yeah, I was, I was going to say, I hope that at some age it's like, ah, wait a minute. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Because <laughs> people get there to needs... that age where, like, I'm in my Buick, I'm backing up, and I don't care who's behind me. Yeah, I'm old, so... fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's like, oh, okay. It's like, Grandma, calm down. Uh, and yeah, and we talked about like MSF course, other type of training. A lot of insurance yep. companies will ask about some types of certification, um, safety features. We also talked oh, about, you mentioned, thing. you mentioned the airbag. Uh, fortunately, ABS is becoming more and more standard. Um, yeah, I think it's required by most governments now. Mm hmm um the, the bikes have to have abs out of the box um i think the last time i did my insurance renewal it asked me if it had traction control so yeah so a lot of companies um will ask stuff like that if you tell them as well mm -hmm. it can help you out so like i I know any bike that has a six axis imu abs traction control it's got a corner abs corner of traction control oddly enough there's probably going to be wheelie control there's going to be you know slipper control all this stuff you know, as much as I don't like the interference of electronics on a bike from a riding experience, mm -hmm. it does, in fact, make it safer, generally, and your insurance company will give you a break if you have those added things. Yeah. Uh, like sometimes you may need to advocate for it and be like, hey, I got this stuff, and just by doing yeah. that, they could be like, oh, okay, and work it out. Yeah, like you, I would absolutely recommend if you haven't gotten an insurance quote anytime, or if you've had insurance for a while, you know, and you haven't spoke to your agent, you'd be like, hey, by the way, my did you guys know my bike has this, this, and this mm -hmm. as as safety equipment? Because if you buy a car, they will ask you, it, it used to be in the 90s, they'd ask you, hey, do you have airbags in your car? Do you have a three-point seatbelt? Because, like, that was not the standard. I mean, it was on new cars, but a lot yeah. of old cars didn't have that. Up until, I think it was, like, 06, most trucks were not legally required to have a three-point seatbelt. You could still get away with a lap belt. Now, almost none of the OEMs did that because it was a, obviously they wanted to be safe and that was a selling point. Mm -hmm. But like the law stated you just had to have a lap belt. And yeah. there was the thing like if you were in a truck, God, when did that law change? I'd have to look it up. But there was like you don't have to wear a seatbelt in a pickup truck. 
that was a thing for a long time. Yeah, I, I guess the Which thinking is, was the truck is big; it's going to protect you, and yeah, yeah it'll protect yeah, you right up but, until you go flying out of the windshield. <laughs> yeah, the truck's not going to get damaged, but you are once you go flying out head yeah. first. So it's like that. Uh, it'll protect you all the way to the scene of the crash. <laughs> Oh man! Uh, then another obvious thing is your Come driving on, history. Uh, so if you're a hooligan with many a ticket, you you pay a little more. Yeah, um, and also like they look at how long you've been riding. So I know we we touched on it earlier, but the fact Experience. that like, yeah. you know, when I was first getting intro, they were like, "Oh, how long have you been riding a motorcycle?" I'm like, "Well, I'm I'm 18." So I've been riding a street bike for two years. And they were like, right, but how long have you been? My interest company was like, well, I know you grew up doing other shit. So, like, you've been on a motorcycle. I'm like, oh, yeah, since I was three. Like, I know how to operate a motorcycle in adverse conditions. And that does, it can help, depending on your insurance agent. Would you say it came in clutch? Oh, boo. Boo. <laughs> boo. Oh, if Chase was here, he'd be laughing. I know. Um but yeah, Dave makes a good point. There is a, you do have what's called an insurance credit score. It is similar to like your traditional buying credit score, mm -hmm. um, but they're calculated slightly differently. Um, your insurance credit score is a, uh, oh God, Shannon, uh, is a, is a factor. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, no, no, I actually think it may be just your regular credit score can factor in too. They both, they both. Yeah. Cause, Cause it's like, I guess if you had a claim or something like is this guy really going to pay his deductible or not? It's yeah, or if you have maybe. If you have a terrible credit score, or if you're young and you don't have a lot of credit, they're going to be like, well, how can we know this guy can afford the insurance, let alone the bike payment? And, mm -hmm. you know, if if you get... The idea is that if you are in financial trouble, you are more likely to make a... Uh, you're more likely to make a like a riskier decision because you're living your life in a riskier way that you're bad with money or whatever. Yeah. And that has nothing to do with your income. Like if you are, you know, I know people that have, I know people that make six figures that are in debt up to their eyeballs and living paycheck to paycheck because they're dumb idiots. Like, you know, it, you know, you just cause you make a lot of money doesn't mean that you're intelligent or that you know how to handle it well or make good choices. Yeah. There's a, yeah. Yeah, how do people get those jobs? Like, I don't know. Like, I gotta figure that out, man. Do I just need to be a dipshit? Like, <laughs> like I, I call the term like failing up. Like, there's mm -hmm. these people that they're in a job, they're falling up the ladder, and, and they don't do well. But I guess somehow they're given enough grace that instead of firing you, we're going to give you the opportunity to go seek employment elsewhere. <laughs> but because of the title they had here, they get a better title over here. And yeah, then they, then just, they just ping, 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 ping. They ping. ping pong up, and they're not doing anything. Like, no. Uh, but I am anyway. <laughs> you know, just I'm. A, I'm a long story short. I'm a big proponent for full coverage if you can afford it. Um, as far as I'm concerned, if you can't afford the insurance on your bike, you cannot afford the bike. Period. Yeah. Like yeah, I, mean, I can afford my my you know, insert bike here two hundred dollar a month payment whatever or sixty buck a month payment depending on what your bike is. But if you can't afford, a lot of people get pissed off because it's like, hey, th your bike payment is sixty dollars. Your insurance is three hundred a month. <laughs> and people are like, well, I can afford the fifty, but I can't afford the three hundred. It's like, well, then you yeah. can't afford the bike. Right. Sorry. So your bike payment, everyone, should be the cost of the bike and the insurance to operate it. <laughs> that's yeah, that's like, your bike payment. Yeah. So I think a lot of people get caught up that like. You know, I think I, I Paige, my wife, financed a Honda Gram a couple of years ago just for, like, she wanted a fun little bike to cruise around on. Mm -hmm. And I think the payment was, like, $35. <laughs> yeah. But the insurance was 140 because she'd never ridden a motorcycle before. That's crazy. Yeah, I was like. I mean, but, I well, mean, it makes sense because, you know, there's people the behind the scenes that run the numbers. But it's also that, you know, they have to look at no experience means this. Yeah, I mean, she could be the or safest like rider in the world, accident. but yeah, on paper, you're you don't have a lot of experience. On paper, you're more likely to have an accident and have a problem. Yeah, I guess so. it's five forty. It's about that time. What what, what time? Chat, do you I know what time it is? I think it's I think it's time for the ghost tip of the week. Sorry, oh wait, I didn't have the scene prep. Okay, reset. Time do, for do the 
I think, you know, it's 541 now. It's about time for the ghost tip of the week. Let's do it. It's my favorite time of the week. <laughs> Finally time for the ghost tip of the week. They can still hear us. So. <laughs> Fix your camera. It. Ghost tip of the week. Oh, God. Sponsored by Ghost on Two Wheels hey. on Instagram, of course. You know, if if I move forward or back too much, it freaks out. <laughs> Just the tip. All right. Uh, you, you, All right, so the ghost tip of the week. If you are prone to losing your contact lenses, just try to keep an eye on it. <laughs> that one is especially for a uh, friend of the show, Donkey Dong Doug. Oh, uh, the old Chunky Chong Chug. So when that we were a at a s- SmortCon this past year, uh, when we stayed at the murder cabin on the night one, uh, <laughs> he lost his contact. Yeah, and, people, why don't you go to Sporkhod? Well, because they stay at a place called the Murder Cabin. <laughs> Let's start there. <laughs> well, several of us went a day earlier, so we took a longer route. We did, like, Tale of the Dragon, Chair Hall of Skyway, uh, okay. on the way up to wherever. I love Chair Hall of Skyway. Oh, it's, my, it's uh, one of my favorite rides. I think the Skyway is better than the Dragon. The Dragon yeah. is, is a test of skill. The Skyway is an enjoyable scenic ride. It's yeah, kind of how I classify. Yeah, the, the fuck the Tale of the Dragon. I hate it. I can't stand it. Yeah. So anyway, uh, he uh, lost his contact, and just oh, no. and so like he was like, I can't see anything, and so like then he couldn't show us the cool roads to take. He had to be the sweeper, and we had to call out like every single like hazard in oh, the roadway. No. <laughs> so he didn't bring a spare set or anything. I, I don't think he brought one. Which so well, lesson learned. A lesson learned. <laughs> Uh, extra contacts. Keep an eye on Either it. Bring your glasses or bring extra contacts. <laughs> oh man. Oh, that's, um, that's funny. Oh, I enjoy doing that. So, absolutely. I mean, uh, I mean, we've kind of hit the big highlights. So I'll throw some out to chat. Like, what are some other things y'all want to know about? As they just get hit with an ad, I think. Uh, yeah, are there other things, you know, as far as administration yep, wise yep. or paperwork wise? and motorcycling that you've encountered that we should talk about um, or questions. Uh, but Pat, do you have anything that you want to add um, to it? We've kind of hit a I lot mean, of it. We've, yeah, we did it a lot. I think um, again, if you can get good insurance, you know, it insurance money is, is a racket, but it is um, the worst thing in the world right up until you really, really need it. You know, it's, it's an absolute waste of money until you have to cash in on it. Yeah. Um, it's a just in case money. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's absolutely just in case money unless unless you have a lot of disposable income and you can set aside a good chunk of money and you have good health insurance to where you 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 can run liability only on the bike and if it if you go down on the bike you can fix it yourself or you're not worried about what it costs to fix you know like a DRZ or a KLR like they're they're so inexpensive to fix those things yeah you know it's really not that big a deal but um, if you can afford the good insurance get the good insurance. Um, um, maybe through your insurance, uh, you may have some roadside assistance with that, but if not, apps, uh, you know, AAA, AAA, um, um, Haggerty, if you, I think Haggerty insures some motorcycles, um, they've got a great, um, like driver, um, like driver assistance program. I think uh, I saw that if like you were a member of the, uh, the AMA, American mm-hmm. Motorcycle Association, they include some type of roadside assistance with that. I yeah, they maybe do. it is with through AAA. They're partnered with AAA. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, that's always a good thing to have, especially if you are one that's doing longer trips. I mean, mm. if you're doing a city commute and your bike breaks down and you can bum a ride, that's maybe not a big deal. But but if you're putting on miles, that may be a good thing to have. Yeah, Nick makes a great point. Factor in tires. Uh, sport bike tires do not last like car tires do. I don't right. think any motorcycle tires really last like car tires, except for maybe like gold wings that use that run dark side tires mm-hmm. um but like you're gonna replace a two generally two rear tires for every front that you do depending on your riding style and what kind of bike you have um and you will burn through like on the sport bike um i was getting to be fair on my ducati i was getting like nine thousand miles out of a rear mm-hmm. um but i was an on 1199s with nearly 200 wheel horsepower after the tune. So it was kind of ridiculous. Um, but yeah, um, another great tip. I see you have it on the list. Is let other people know where you're going. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I try not to ride alone if I'm like going out for like a long trip for the, you know, or like if I'm going out for six, seven hours, 
unless I'm going somewhere that I've been a million times and I know that there's good cell coverage the entire way, mm -hmm. I try not to ride alone. Yeah. Um, if I do, I've got a little, um, you know, the GPS spot thing. Chase has one. Um, and like my whole friend, not my whole friend group, but like a good portion of like my local riding buddies is we all have, we most of us have iPhones and we have each other's location on our phones. Mm-hmm. And like we turn it on and off based on if we're riding that day or not. Um, <laughs> so like, God forbid anything happens to you, your buddies aren't. Because I hate to say this, we had a, a friend pass a number of years back, um, and like no one knew where he was. He was in a spot on Blood Mountain that, um, just his, the cell reception was terrible, so it kept going straight to voicemail, and mm -hmm. nobody could ping where he was exactly. Um, like the police couldn't ping where his phone was. Yeah. Um, turns out it was like off the side of the mountain, but, um, you know, <laughs> having no your buddies, sharing your location with your buddies is an absolute game changer. We basically, our whole, our whole crew after that was like, cool. Everybody has everyone's location. Like, yeah. All the time. Yeah. It, it's a, just in case, you know, just, yeah. I mean, yeah, and, and that's good just... advice for, you know, even if you're doing a solo car trip, you know, just yeah. let somebody know where you're going at least so that they can. Yeah. And like what, what the general plan is, where you plan on going. If you, Hey, I've got, I'm staying at, you know, tell your spouse, tell your homie, tell your best bud, whatever. Hey, I'm going to this city. I'm staying at this hotel tonight. Yeah. You know, I'll text you when I get there. Like, yeah. it, you know, kiss the homies. Good night. Weird shit like that. You know, just make sure. Oh um, yeah. Oh, Ooh, yeah. Chase Thomas, member for 13 months. What'd you miss? Uh, Chase is in my A because uh, he's a punk uh, having a good breakfast lunch with his fan or breakfast lunch. Uh, so, uh, what I said. Breakfast <laughs> lunch. Chase Thomas, uh, the uh, tip of the week was for you related to uh, SmartCon. So go back and check that out. <laughs> yep. Pack, yep. Pack an extra contact, buddy. Yep. Yep. yep, um, yep. Bring your glasses. I would say another thing. Uh, just maintaining your bike, which you should be doing anyway. And I mean that kind of outside of the regular maintenance of taking it to the shop or whatever, but just, yeah. you know, like you said, with the tires uh, before being, being able to check your tires, recognizing when they need to be changed. Um, mm -hmm. You know, just looking, cleaning the chain. I know you don't have to worry about that with your shaft drive, which big perk, but yep. um it's great. I change the shaft drive oil every other oil change. It's great. Yeah. So it's is it just is it just change that and then it's like yep. Yeah, treat it like an oil change. Drain the fluid out. Put new fluid in it. New crush washers. Call it a day. A uh, little tangent. I have heard that while chains. Hold on. Hold on. Okay. Tangent on live on two wheels. Listen, I'm trying to actually call it out to be <laughs> professional <laughs> about it instead of just so ADHD. <laughs> <laughs> um i've heard that uh of course chain driven bikes more maintenance then mm -hmm. you've got kind of belt drives in the middle shaft drives on the other end low maintenance yep but that the the chain drives actually give transfer more power from the engine to the rear wheel you don't have that loss technically like you, that is accurate yeah. um because belts stretch under mm -hmm. load um and if they're not adjusted properly they will stretch quite a good bit um, if your chain is your chain stretches over time, and if it's yeah. not adjusted properly, you'll lose that. But shaft drives are much greater rotational mass, mm -hmm. so it takes more power to get them moving and stopped and things like that. Yep. So a chain drive is your most direct power. So say you had a 200 horsepower chain drive bike, you're probably going to see between the transmission and the chain 180, 85 horsepower at the wheel. Yep. On a belt drive bike, you're going to see 170 to 175. On a shaft drive, you're probably going to see somewhere near that 165 to 170. So it's like maybe a 10%. Yeah, maybe, it's not something a like huge. That. Now, the difference 195 to 165 is obviously a, a decent chunk, but you know, we're talking 15% at that point. But the thing about shaft drives is they're much more direct. Yeah. So like, I don't when I smack the throttle, there's no lag. It is instant. Right. You know, if you've got a chain that's got a little extra slack, it takes a second for that. You know, there's a kind of uh, a, you could feel the slack in your chain sometimes and, and on belt drives as well, where a shaft drive, there is zero. What's that word for like the time it takes for like, you know, chains or buckles to kind of 
catch is it slag is that the term slack S- it's well not slack but there's another one for like the i don't oh. know mm-hmm. i'm thinking of something else it'll come to me later or i just sounded like an idiot anyway we'll bring the tangent back in but but yeah pros yep. and cons to each uh you know yep. it would be nice in my later years <laughs> when I can go to, oh, I can afford the big shaft drive bike. I just don't have to worry yeah. about it. Super T was cheap, dog. I mean, Super T was cheap. I mean, you know. Uh, yeah. So, uh, what w- what else do we need to look out for as far um, as moto administration? Honestly, I think I think let's stick on the on the maintenance thing for a second because yeah, whether you, no matter if you're on a shaft drive a belt or a, or a you know chain drive bike, um checking your tire pressure checking your brake fluids checking your oil levels things like that you know in your manual if you re- rtfm read the fucking manual it will tell you to check all of those things every single time you get on the bike now i ride probably anywhere between three and seven days of the week depends on rain if, like if it's if it's cold i don't care i'll ride but if it's raining i'm if i have the use of my car i'll probably take the car but there are a lot of days where if it's only gonna rain in the morning and be or rather, if it's only going to rain in the afternoon, I'll ride. Mm-hmm. I don't mind getting wet on the ride home. I'm not trying to get wet on the ride to work. Same. Um, yeah. I have I have no problem getting rained on on the way home because I'll get home and just you know. Well, that happened to me but... on uh, Tuesday. I, uh, oh no! Uh, there was a there's a little uh, <clears throat> a break in the seam in my rain pants. Uh, oh no! Right in the perineum. So ah. <laughs> so mm. once once that first little like line mm. of water got in there and i'm riding along and it was like oh new pants Time oh for new that's pants. cold <laughs> that's cold i'm well, uh, sure but yeah same but way i'm like if if i get wet and then you know get home that's fine but i don't want to come into the office going quick, quick, quick. yeah exactly <laughs> um but you know i probably i check my oil at least once a week i check my tire pressures at least once a week um, I check my brake fluid almost every time I get on the bike. I just kind of mm-hmm. do a quick visual. Anytime I get on the bike, I roll it out of the garage, throw it up on the center stand. I spin the front wheel around. I spin the back wheel around. And I just, and it's usually I do it like first thing in the morning when I'm leaving. And I check, kind of give it a, a quick once over to check everything is good. Make mm-hmm. sure I don't have any like weird chunking on my tires or anything strange like that. And then I'll take off. I'm good to go. Yeah. Um, but I do like almost every week, I do like a full, probably spend 45 minutes like really checking every little thing. Yeah, that's um, good. Because, you know, bikes are theoretically simpler than cars, right? But they also have much greater uh, consequences for a failure. Yes. Well, and, and I think one of the things that makes them simple too, and it's they're easier to work on because the components are right there. Like you don't yeah, have to dig through under everything. Um, but it's also not unless it's a sport bike. Good luck with that. Oh, unless it's a sport bike, you got a lot of fairings. But but even yeah. with that, um, it, there's stuff still exposed that's not covered in like the hood of a car. So yeah, some things can get knocked loose and such. So it's it's a, it is a good idea to check it out, make sure things are tight and everything like that. Um, yeah, you know, tie it well, lubricated. You know, cleaning and adjusting your chain is recommended by the manufacturer of almost. I don't want to say almost all, but the vast majority of manufacturers, I think it's every five to 800 miles. Mm-hmm. And it's not a, like, check it. It is a clean lube and a just. Every mm-hmm. five to 800 miles is the recommended time to do it. Yeah. Chase is horrible about that. <laughs> Most people that I know are horrible about that. Well, And you especially want to check the chain slack if you get a new chain, because it's going to break in the most within the first, you know, 100 miles or whatever. So. Yeah, a couple, a couple hundo. So yeah, check it then too. Uh, but yeah, c- come up with a schedule. I mean, like Pat, I like your idea. Like at least once a week, kind of giving it yeah. a good once over. I mean, you do hear it like do the T clocks before every ride. Let's be honest, we're not going to do that. But if you yeah. can commit yourself like once a week, like I'm, I'm like you, I'm checking my tire pressure once a week. But you know, if I'm going into the office, you know, a couple days in a row, I'm not checking it every single time. But yeah, like I said, like you know, if I if I'm going in in the morning like i'll roll the bike out get it up on the center stand because it's just and then i'm while i'm putting my gear on i'm kind of looking everything over you know i can um you know it's not difficult to take that extra 30 to 45 seconds 
yeah to, Ch- to really look at everything chase thomas uh good thing check your lights too check your yep. brake lights because mm-hmm. you never it, see them You're if on the you bike. don't see them and then they go out guess who else is not going to see them that car yep. coming behind you uh so yeah it's check your blinkers yep. uh if you have leds good You're, but still it's it's good yeah. to make sure there's no wiring issues or whatever uh, yeah things like I, that, I like so. almost treat it like a like a little pre-flight checklist yeah you know turn signals headlights brake lights all the all the controls feel good everything is snappy cool tires look good tires look good mm. you know take a quick glance at your brake your brakes cool brakes look good great cool not worried about it i'll do yeah. my big check later on in the week yeah take off yeah so i mean th- this is a. Uh... There, there's a lot more to this motorcycling hobby, I guess you could say, uh, than just hopping on yeah. and going. So hopefully we've covered most of that today. Cause I feel like we have. There's a lot to it. A good bit. Um, I, I think feel like we stayed on track well today, too, well, yeah. which is rare for us. Well, I wonder why this is his. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you have pretty good ADHD, but I think I can wrangle in one of you more than just. Yeah. When both of you here, I'm just kind of like, I give up. Yeah, I'm not hyper caffeinated today, so that's probably why. <laughs> uh, uh, no, but I I find that once you get into the motorcycle community, like doing your own maintenance is almost just th- there's a certain appeal to it as well. Yeah, like, it's you know being familiar with your bike, you know, in the event you break down, mm-hmm. is really easy. Actually, uh, Chase and I, quick side tangent on on topic side tangent. Uh, Chase and I made uh, had a conversation uh, at a couple of meetings this week, um, and during one of those meetings, I was talking about all these brand new bikes with everything is super electronic, like the new BMWs. Most most new BMWs, I think the Ducatis and the KTM's are this way too. They're so electronic you can't bump start them. Mm. Like the, a bike will not let you. Like you can do it all you want, it's not going to fire because the electrical system doesn't have enough power. Right. So, like, if you get a low battery or a dead battery on a lot of modern bikes, you're just screwed. Yeah. But even something as simple as, like, I've had, due to ridiculous, you know, me off-roading the Super T like a moron, is I've bent, like, a, an ABS sensor to where, like, it was no longer reading correctly. Mm-hmm. So, but I know I'm so familiar with that bike. I pulled the seat off, pulled the passenger seat off, pulled the ABS fuse. Mm-hmm. And I'm able, because of how that bike is set up electronically, I'm still able to ride that bike with no ABS. Yeah. No problem. A lot of the modern bikes, if your ABS doesn't work, you're stuck. Yeah. It shouldn't go work. It's not going anywhere. You'll yeah. be in lip mode. And, like, being really familiar with your machine and by doing your own maintenance, it's going to give you a lot of confidence to, in the event you run into an issue, you can mm-hmm. probably handle it or you can jerry-rig it enough to get at least to a safe place. You run off, you run you know, you have a major issue on the side of 400, you're going to want to at least get to the next exit, you know, get off of the main freeway, whatever. If you can jerry-rig it to get where you're going. Yeah. For those not in the know, 400 is a, like, major Mm. highway here in Atlanta where... Yeah, it's it's basically an interstate. The speed limits are just simply suggestions. (laughs) Yeah, I think... (laughs) Which is general around about Atlanta, but 400 is can be, like, just a... Yeah, I'm... I'm, I'm, (laughs) probably going to self-incriminate here a little bit but there have been times more than three years in the past that's a statute of limitation disorder more than three <laughs> years in the past that i have noticed a 65 mile an hour speed limit and if you're doing under 80 you're going to get run over by somebody gosh yeah it's like you you have to just be hot and like it, when you're doing 80 in a pack of 50 cars all doing 80 it doesn't feel like you're going that fast because you're going the same speed as everybody else. Right. But then you pass somebody, like you blow by somebody doing 65, the speed limit. You're like, what is that idiot doing? They're going so slow. And then you look down and you're like, nope, we're all hauling ass. Hence the reason <laughs> location factors into your insurance. Yep. And on that note, I think we'll wrap it up. So, yep. Thanks uh, for watching, guys. Thank you, Ghost, for getting this together yet again. You are a gentleman and a scholar and a much appreciated. Yeah. Um, so, I think next week, um, and it's, it's spring break, but, you know, we might we might dabble into like a little members only BS show type of thing. Yeah, we'll see. see we'll see what, what we sort, of, sort of or, shenanigans we get into. Or we may just be like, meh, we're going to go enjoy yeah. the, the weather and the pollen. Uh, Oh, the pollen. Gosh, that sucks. Anyways. You know what we ought to do? We ought to, like, get up to somewhere in North Georgia. We ought to go ride on a Thursday and do live on two wheels 
from like TWO or something. Oh, I thought you were going to say actually do it from like being on the bike. I mean, we could. You know that I, you know it's possible. I've done it. Well, yeah. I'm just thinking we would need the base station running. We we can do it. You've got Spectre. I've, Bye, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Bye, guys. Let me find the fart sound. I timed that perfectly. I went, mm, at the same time. <laughs> See y'all next time, everybody. Bye. Yeah, I mean, I guess if you just eat enough of that stuff, it just turns you, wait. The protein, right?